awesome to be with you. I consider it a privilege to be here, to be able to share. I love this ministry. I've had great respect for Ken and Robin for so many years. So I don't, it's really a privilege actually to share. There's a, there are churches that I speak at a lot. You know what, you guys, right on the door, just as you're going out on the platform, it says, remember, it is a privilege to stand on this stage. It is not a right. And that really is the proper uh, way we should look at things. Everything is a privilege when we minister in the kingdom. So I really do feel privileged to be able to speak to you. I've only been coming to Australia for about three and a half years. I've fallen in love with this country. I thought, I don't need to come here. There's all the YWAMers in churches, you know. And I wanted to see crocodiles and Ayers Rock and all that stuff. But I've just absolutely fallen in love with this country, with the people. So uh, it, I'm just jazzed to be in Australia every time I come. Now, I like to laugh. So we're going to start by laughing before we do anything, OK? And then I want to talk to you about something really serious. But uh, one of the things I do, I've been traveling in missions now 40, well, many years. Dinosaurs still roam the earth when I started. <laughs> and, and I've been in 150 countries doing things and not the normal countries. <laughs> I've been in the really underdeveloped frontier countries. So I get on little national airlines that are like held together with duct tape and bubble gum and a little bit of wire. And when you're flying in them, you're just terrified for your life, like we're going to die at any minute. So instead of being in fear, I decided I'm going to turn it into fun experiences. <laughs> so what I decided to do is I would give nicknames to the airlines while I was flying on them, OK? So I want to share some of those nicknames. Taka. Taka is the airline of Guatemala. And I was on it, the first time I was on it, I decided that meant take a chance airlines. <laughs> and then the second time I was on it, I realized it's take a coffin along. <laughs> That's what Taka is. So when you're on outreach on these airlines, I want you to put nicknames to it and send them to me so I could add it to the whole list here. Then there's an airline called Aeroflot, which was the old airline of the Soviet Union. And if you've ever flown on it, you know why we call it Aeroflop. <laughs> the last Aeroflop flight I was on was 1989, before the collapse of the Soviet Union. I was going from Leningrad to Moscow. And they brought us out to the plane. You walk onto the runway. And when we got to the plane, it was an old World War II plane. And the front, the nose of it was glass, and where they used to have the guy with the machine gun. <laughs> and except there was a chair and a guy with a map. And the guy with the map, there was the stairway up to the pilot. He's looking up going, turn right at the next mountain. <laughs> See? They had no instruments to tell them where they were. There was a guy with a map in the front glass telling the pilot how to go. Yeah. What's that? I don't know. <laughs> I have no clue. That would be wild. But you guys, it was so hilarious. They had, just, they had just done renovation on the plane, which meant they just took a paintbrush and painted everything gray. <laughs> everything, including the seats. <laughs> so when you sat in them, you stuck to the seats. And so they loaded the plane. There was me and two other YWAMers in one row. Let's see, I wonder if someone who's good with computers could come and mess with this. Well, it's not seeming to connect. Let's see if that happens. Oops. Uh, so anyway, um, uh, we're stuck to the seats. And after they filled the pl plane with people, they loaded luggage in the aisles. And then they brought on cages with chickens and sheep. <laughs> And then they brought in people who were sitting on top of the cages with kitchens, chickens and sheep right in the aisle. So that's, that's really how the flight was. And then we started to take off. And we were going slow. And it just wouldn't get speed. And we were going and going and not taking off. And we were going like two miles, it felt like, you know, or three kilometers. And I thought, dear Lord, we're driving to Moscow. That's what we're doing, <laughs> you know. Then finally, the plane gets up in the air, you know, and, and it was, we were praying really hard. Then it was time to serve refreshments. 
So we had this big, you know, kind of Russian babushka lady coming down the <laughs> aisle, you know, with a tray. And I was on the end of the aisle. She said, coffee, tea, or Coke? I said, I'd like a Coke. She said, we have no co Coke. Drink tea. <laughs> <laughs> then she turned to the guy next to me. She goes, coffee, tea, or Coke? <laughs> he said, Coke. Oh, no, he said, coffee. She said, we have no coffee. Drink tea. <laughs> so it was just crazy. That's why we call it Aeroflop, OK? Then there's TAP, you know, an airline called TAP. I decided that means take another plane. <laughs> then an airline called Sasa which was the airline of El Salvador. I was on it, and I was convinced it meant stay at home, stay alive. <laughs> That's what Sasa means. And then in 2002, I had the unique joy of flying on an airline called Ariana. Ariana is the national airline of Afghanistan. OK, and if you've ever flown on Ariana, you'll know why we call it Scariana. That's really, there's a good reason. Now listen, I'll tell you why it's Scariana. Afghanistan had four planes, and they were all really old. They were French airline planes that the French would no longer fly them. They were so bad, then they donated them to Afghanistan, who used them for the next 20 years. But during the war with Afghanistan, the American war, my country blew up all four planes, exploded them. And then what the new government of Afghanistan did was take parts of all the different exploded planes and put them together to make one plane that would fly, OK? <laughs> and uh, is this fan working? Oh, yeah. Let's, can we get this aimed? Shane, could you kind of aim that at me? So, Because I don't, uh, the humidity, I'm not used to that. OK, so one plane that would fly, OK? Now, people don't believe me, so I actually have pictures to show you. So I was going to be on the second ever Ariana flight, OK? So the first time it ever flew, one of my missionary YWAMer, a friend, was on the very first flight. She said, Fred, she said, you're going to be on that plane in three days. Start fasting and praying now. <laughs> she said, we were in Dubai to take off, she said. And we, got, they, we started to go down the runway. And there was a loud bang out on the wing. And so the plane threw on the brakes. They went back to the terminal. And these little Afghan mechanics came out with a big roll of duct tape and started wrapping duct tape around the wing. And for 15 minutes, they wrapped tape around the wing. She said, then we went back onto the runway and took off. She said, now, you pray, because I don't know what was wrong, but they only fixed it with duct tape. So I started praying for the next three days, oh Lord. And so when I was getting on the very second flight, here's Ariana, and they're taking us out to the airplane. And the planes are so old, you go in through the back like this. And, as, and I looked out on the wing, and there was all the tape still there, except they painted over it to make it the color of the airline, because to them, this was a permanent repair. And so I was praying like, Jesus, 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 as I was getting on the plane. And when I saw the inside of the plane, it was just because you could see all the different pieces from the different planes. There's some were like black charred with the fire from the explosion. Some was like melted plastic. And down the aisle, there was like plywood, you know, nailed down. And then a piece of tin. And then a little bit of carpet. And then more wood, you know. So I went right to the emergency exit row. That's where I sat. Uh, and uh, the other Westerners on the flight, we all got on the emergency exit row. And then most of the plane filled up with Afghan tribal people. So after we're all on the plane, we start to taxi to take off. And I was praying in every prayer I knew. And you guys, as we're starting to take off, suddenly all the stewardesses jumped out of their seats as we're going down the runway. And they planted themselves in the aisle. And they put their hands up on the overhead compartments. And I thought, this is weird. And you know when the plane takes off, when it leaves the runway, there's a little bump. You ever notice that? Just when the wheels. So when the wheels, there was that little bump, 
all the overheads that they weren't holding opened up and all the luggage is coming out and hitting people in the head, you know, and they were holding the air, the compartments closed. So we finally get up in the air and we're on our way to Dubai. It's like a two hour flight from Kabul and halfway through the flight it is time for lunch. So they start to come down the aisle with these trays just loaded with plates of rice pilau, you know, which is a, a thing they eat in Central Asia there. It's awesome actually. And so the stewardess, as she's coming down the aisle, she tripped where like the, the plywood <laughs> met the carpet and, and the, the plates went all down the aisle, all the rice in the aisle. And the plane had not been cleaned in like 40 years. I'm not joking, and it was all like sheep uh, presents, little sheep dropping. There's, you can't believe what's in these planes, I mean. So how do you know, is that a raisin or is that? Because <laughs> no, they put raisins in the Palau, you know. So I thought, oh, no big deal. There's restaurants at the Dubai airport. You know, I'll just get something there. You know, no big deal, no lunch. But no, not on Ariana. All the stewardesses ran to the aisle. They're scooping the rice in a big pile. And they're putting it back in the plates like this. And coming, they go, would you like some lunch? And I said, oh, oh, no, thank you. I, you know, I'm, I'm not hungry right now. She said, oh, you must be a holy man. Are you fasting? I said, oh, yes, fasting. <laughs> you know, that's what she asked. So this is Scariana, okay? So then we finally make it to Dubai. We're coming in for a landing. And you guys, there, as we're just about to land, the stewardess are in the aisle holding everything again. And you guys, when the plane hit the ground, a whole bunch of things happened all at once. And I can't wait to get to heaven and ask God to replay that in slow motion, okay? Because like uh, the, all at once, you know, we hit the ground hard, the overheads open and luggage coming out. And right in the emergency exit row were all the Western aid workers. So I'm sitting there. There was a German aid worker behind me. And he was nervous, so he's kind of leaning forward. And the minute the plane hit the ground, the lock on my seat broke. And my seat went whomp back like that and hit him in the head. <laughs> and it actually put a dent in his forehead. <laughs> You know, and I'm there laying like this as we're landing. <laughs> then there was a French aid worker across the way by the door, and the planes are so old, like the windows are actually round with brass, like a portal of a ship, and made of glass. And the emergent, the exit sign was made of glass. And when we hit, that glass sign popped out of the wall and it sliced across the forehead <laughs> like that. And I look over and here's this French guy holding this <laughs> sign with the wires curling up into the wall, blood coming down his face. He's kind of dazed. <laughs> yeah, I'm not joking. This honest to goodness truth. But the best, the best. <laughs> two rows up and to the left, there was an Afghan tribal guy, you know, buckled into his seat. And when we hit the ground, his seat just went right out of the floor, <laughs> up to the ceiling, and then he fell down <laughs> in the aisle with the seat, seat belted to him. And he kept trying to get up, you know. <laughs> and the stewardess are saying, just lay down, so we just, <laughs> you know. Then we get into the terminal and they unbuckled him <laughs> and got him out of the seat. God is my witness. I did not, there's, that's Scariana, okay? Now people don't believe this, right? They don't believe it. So when I was going to the airport, when you drive into the Kabul airport, this is what you see. You know, I took video. You know, you see all the exploded planes <laughs> that they took pieces from for like a kilometer as you're going into the airport, which does not build your confidence. <laughs> and you begin to wonder, why do they call that building a terminal? <laughs> See, yeah, so really, I mean, this is really, honest to goodness truth. So many adventures and missions. <laughs> okay, I wanna talk to you tonight about a very important subject that I call healing the gospel. I want to talk about healing the gospel.
You know, we in YWAM, our big, our desire is to bless God by fulfilling his greatest desire, which is that his love, the message of love, would go to every tribe, every tongue, every nation, every people. We want people saved, uh, societies uh, transformed, the seven spheres of societies transform uh, the power of God, you know, and we want to see the church established in every place. So that's what I live for, actually. I, it's what I dream about, I pray about, I think about all the time. So I'm always thinking, how can we see more people come to the Lord, uh, both in the places where we live, like I live in the United States and travel a lot outside the country, where we live in other places, India, China, Nepal, et cetera. And so one of the things that's concerned me uh, over the past decade is I've watched the, in the decreasing effectiveness of the preaching of the gospel in my country, in Europe, uh, in many other countries of the world. And I began, I've really thought in my mind that the problem isn't with the gospel. The gospel is the power of God. There's got to be something in how we're presenting the gospel or what we're doing that really isn't uh, impacting these new generations that are rising up. And so uh, I started to, as I've prayed and thought about this for many years, I began to see some things that I think we need to make adjustments in the gospel. I call it healing the gospel. I think the gospel message we share has got a little bit of a cold, just a little bit of a cold. You know, it's not really well. It's kind of the nose is running and the coughing. And we've got to bring healing to that message in order to be relevant to the world uh, that's, you know, the, the modern world, actually, and to see the gospel go farther to the ends of the earth. So um, there's some things I've been thinking about, and I think we've got the gospel, the way we preach it and share it, I think we've got it backwards, or I think we don't, we don't have it complete. So I want to just share with that. In Mark 16, Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation, okay? So we better know what it is if we're supposed to do that, okay? If you look up in a dictionary gospel, it says good news. That's what the word gospel, we know that gospel means good news. So why is it that people don't see it as good news? Why do they see it as something that's restrictive or something that's, boy, that's not fun, or wow, your God is really not a happy guy, see? Why don't they see it as good news? It's because of what we present as the gospel and actually how we present it in Protestantism. Now, I'm sort of a, I'm, I'm mostly a Protestant. I was raised Catholic. Uh, one of the white women led me to the Lord. I was in a Baptist church. Then I wound up in an Assembly of God church. And then, let's see, I wound up at an independent charismatic fellowship. So I've had this journey. Then about five years ago, the Anglicans in North America abducted me, kidnapped me. The Anglican bishops all said, we just decided you're an Anglican. <laughs> and they made me the canon of missions for the Anglican church in North America to tell them, you know, to kind of give direction to all the Anglicans about missions. I didn't know what that meant. I have a canon, I'm not an Anglican, right? So I didn't know. Well, I've sort of, uh, what I am is a Baptist Luthercostal Calvinian. That's what I am. I'm a Protestant Anglo Catholic. That's what I am. I'm sort of a historic, you know, primitive Christian, as I guess what I would call myself now. But I didn't know what canon meant. This is so cool, you guys. Canon means like you're the Pope of missions. So even the archbishops have to obey me when I talk about missions. So I went to the first conference. People are reading my a big conference. They're reading my name tag. It says Fred Marker, canon of missions, uh, Anglican Church, North America. And when people would see that, they do this little bow. They start bowing to me. I said, whoa, could you teach my staff to do that? <laughs> you know, <laughs> please come and teach my staff. But what, I've, what, what my heart has been set on getting to the core of Christianity, the core of the gospel, and learning from the historic church, because there were Christians before 1517, <laughs> and they have things to teach us. <laughs> we should learn from the good things and take them, because the version of Protestantism we have now is one of the most potent things on the planet. It is awesome. God is using the Protestant church to transform the world. But Protestantism was a reaction 
to abuses in the Catholic Church. And like every reactionary movement, as they try to purify what's not good and what's good, they cut out some things that are good, along with some things that are bad. And now we need to re-inject those good things that were cut out that we really need in Protestantism if we're going to really reach the world. I'll just tell you three of them. There's a whole bunch of things I've discovered over the past few years. But Protestantism doesn't have a well-developed theology of beauty. And without a theology of beauty, our preaching of the gospel is not going to be absolutely complete and also not going to have the impact in the world that God intended to have. We also don't have a theology of celebration. Now, in YWAM, we have these things. YWAM, we're, we're kind of a more primitive, primal, essential, foundational form of Christianity. We have some of these things in YWAM. We're really blessed, you guys. I work a lot with local churches, and every time with a local church, I'm saying, thank God I'm a YWAMer, because we have some of these things that are missing, a, a theology of celebration. And we don't also have a Protestant theology of suffering. In fact, we have just the opposite. And because of the lack of these three things, as well as some others, the gospel hasn't, doesn't have as much impact as it could have. Okay, so. Let's define the gospel. Here's where we're going to start. OK. When I was in Bible school, they taught me we must let the Bible define the Bible. The Bible will give us the definition for the words it uses. We shouldn't make up definitions. And so the, the term gospel is used 97 times in the New Testament. But the scripture where we get like God saying, OK, pay attention. This is it. This is the gospel. The clearest expression of it is in Galatians 3.8. It says the scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announced the gospel in advance to Abraham saying, Jesus is going to come and die on a cross for your sins. Is that what God said to Abraham? And yet that's what we define as the gospel in modern Protestant circles. The gospel is what God said to Abraham when he said, all nations will be blessed through you. <laughs> God defines the gospel message as all nations will be blessed through you. How many times do you hear preachers get up and say, you're going to preach the gospel. Here it is. All nations will be blessed through you. <laughs> no, we don't hear that. And yet that is how God defines the gospel. In Acts 3, we see the same message. Uh, Peter, the second time he's full of the Holy Spirit, he's preaching. He said, I'm going to preach the gospel to you. Here it is. Indeed, all the prophets from Samuel on, as many as have spoken, have foretold these days. You are heirs of the prophets and the covenant that God made with your fathers when he said to Abraham, through your descendants, all nations on earth will be blessed. So for the second time in the New Testament, when it's talking about the gospel, it's quoting this verse in Genesis where God said to Abraham, your descendants will bless all the nations. A third time in the New Testament, in the context of the gospel, whose name comes up? It says, when God made his promise to Abraham saying, I will surely bless you until you bless the nations, God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of, what, of the promise. That's us. We're the heirs, the descendants. And so three times in the New Testament, it tells us that the gospel is what God said to Abraham. Abraham, I will bless you, and then through you, bless the nations. Okay, Genesis 12, 1 to 3. In fact, that scripture, Genesis 12, is quoted by the New Testament more times than it quotes any other Bible verse because it's showing us how important it is to God. So this is the true gospel message. Here it is. Here's the core of it. I will bless you. That's the gospel. The gospel isn't Jesus died for our sins. That's the result of the gospel. The gospel is God is a God of blessing. God is a God who's for us. He's not against us. God is a God who wants to bring joy, happiness, cheerfulness, healing, completeness in our life. The gospel message is God is not Starting with us, our sin and the need of a savior, the gospel message starts with God and who he is. 
I am a God of blessing. I am for you, not against you. I don't want to punish you. I want to help you. I'm really on your side. I want you to have a full and exciting and rich life. The gospel is the message of the nature and character of God himself. That is the gospel message. God is a good God, not a bad God. He's for us, not against us. The nature, character, ways of God is the good news. See, now no other religion on the planet has a God who's a good God. Every other religion has gods who are angry, mad, demand sacrifices, chop off your hand if you steal something. We are the only ones who have a God whose heart is for us, not against us. So the gospel message preceded Jesus' death on the cross, you guys, because God preceded Jesus' death on the cross. And God has been the same, you know, before even the beginning of time. God was who he is. And so the good news is who God is. And you know what? That is the biggest problem people have with Christianity, is their vision of who God is. That's why people don't come to him. They think he's mean, he's nasty, doesn't want us to have any fun, he's judgmental, etc. They have a warped view of who God is. So when we go, and in Protestant circles we say, you're a sinner and you need Jesus to die for you, they, we're starting at the wrong place. Where God starts the gospel is at, who am I? I am a God of blessing, see? But we don't start there. We start later in the story. And people's biggest problem is understanding who God is. And so our first job in preaching the gospel to people who don't know Christ is explaining who God is, not explaining who they are or their sin. <laughs> it's explaining. We must start where God starts. He's a God of blessing. And guess what? That God of blessing, he's amazing. You know, David Hamilton told us, he's doing this verb view Bible. The top three verbs attributed to God in Genesis are God gives, God blesses, God creates. It doesn't say he's, a jud he's judging, he's convicting, he's condemning. No. The main three verbs, he gives, blesses, creates. And this is what the world doesn't know. They don't know a, a God who gives, blesses, creates. And you know, why don't they know that? Because a lot of preaching doesn't start at the nature, character, ways of God. It starts at you're a filthy, rotten sinner, and you're in need of a savior, and aren't you so glad that Jesus came to die, to die for you? See, we start by actually our preaching often condemns people, and that's why they want nothing to do with the gospel, because they're not seeing the beautiful, lovely, delightful God who's on our side and just wants to bless our life, right? Or in the Command View Bible, David Hamilton has showed, told us 80% of God's commands are stated in the positive. They're all positive commands, 80%. People think all his commands are, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. See, that's the view we as Protestants have given most of the world, that God's a God of thou shalt not, by our preaching and everything. 20% are stated in the negative, but most of them are don't fear, don't worry about tomorrow. There's only a small group that says don't do this and don't do that, see? But those are the ones that for much of the Protestant history that we focused on preaching. So that's what unbelievers hear, and so they have a warped picture of who our God is. They don't see him as the God of blessing. Uh, they see him as a God who um, is really kind of against them. In fact, the New Testament uses the term preaching the gospel 17 times before Jesus even died. So if they were preaching the gospel before the cross even happened, what were they preaching? <laughs> they were preaching, it says, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, telling the poor, God wants to bless you, healing the sick, bringing the good news of the God who wants to bless them. And so we have got to make a shift in the Protestant church, and I believe we in YWAM, God's called us to be leaders in many ways. We can lead in this, helping to heal the gospel, and in fact, that's part of our foundations. God built into us awesome, right from our foundations, awesome woman of God, Joy Dawson, whose teaching is about the nature, ways, character of God, right? And that's one of the founding pillars of our mission, and so God wants us to be people who are excellent at talking about the character of God to unbelievers. Excellent 
of talking about God's a God of blessing to unbelievers. Excellent about talking about his nature, character, and ways, but most Christians aren't able to do that. He's a God of blessing. That's the first part of the gospel. And we see it in every graph we can look at. Okay, I've got to talk faster. Oh my gosh, I've got to talk faster. Time's going away. Here's a, a graph of the quality of life of all the countries in the world. Actually, it was done by YWAMers in a book called Target Earth in 1989. And I know the YWAMer who put this together, all the nations of the world, quality of life, her name is Barb Overgaard. And she was praying one morning, and the Lord said, color that graph according to religion. She'd never thought of that, so she color coded it according to religion. Dark purple is Christianity. Green is Islam. Uh, Hinduism, Buddhism are, are uh, yellow and orange. And what does that graph of quality of life in the nations, according to religion, what does it show us? The Christianized countries have the best quality of life. They are the most blessed with health, education, you know, safety, security, all this good stuff. Even these graphs, UN statistics show that our God's a God of blessing. When we serve him, we are blessed. The green, look at the Muslim countries, are some of the, the uh, least quality of life. It's because they're not serving the one true God who wants to bless in every way with health, education, you know, prosperity, and other things. Okay? Every graph we look at shows our God of blessing, infant mortality. Okay, red is the Muslim world. Uh, in Djibouti, uh, 200 babies for every 1,000 die at childbirth. In what, Afghanistan, all, 190 out of 1,000. Okay, look at the Hindu world. See, not blessed. They're not serving God. Let me overlay Christian countries' infant mortality. That's our infant mortality in the Christianized countries. So everything we look at will show that our God's a God of blessing and we serve him, we're blessed in every way, see? So the gospel is really about who is God. That's the thing we have to redeem in people's mind before we even talk about who is man and what's wrong with man and then the solution. So the gospel message is about the goodness of God. In fact, global poverty, you guys, 1983, 52% of the world in poverty. By 2014, it was down to 21%. I just read the latest UN report yesterday. The UN is reporting only 17% of the world is in poverty right now. It's declined farther to 17%. And almost 100% of the decline is in the newly and the rapidly Christianized countries. Why? Because God is a God of blessing. That's the message. That's the core. When we embrace God, we get blessings in every way in our life and society. In fact, the, of the 21% or 17% of the people who are still in poverty, 85% of them are in unreached people groups in the 1040 window, people who don't have God. So the good news is Jesus, God, is a God of blessing. If he wasn't, he wouldn't have sent Jesus. He would have said, I'm not going to help you if he wasn't. So Jesus coming to earth is a result of the good news. Because God is good, it says, Paul said, even when you were sinners, you weren't even trying to be good. And he said, even when you were rebelling against God, he said, I'm going to help you anyway. See, I'm going to send Jesus to free you from your sin. So the death of Christ is actually the result of the real good news, which is God is a good God who is on our side, who is looking at how he can bless us, okay? And in fact, that's what uh, Paul, uh, Luke tells us in Acts. When God raised up his servant, Jesus, he sent him first, and he put it in terms of blessing. He would sent him to bless you by turning you from your wicked ways. That's one of the ways we get blessed, okay? And we see it also, Paul says in Romans, you guys, or do you think lightly? He's saying, you guys are all messed up. You're preaching conviction, uh, condemnation. You're preaching the law. You know, you're preaching all this stuff. He said, why do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness? God is rich. He's talking about unbelievers. He's rich in kindness to unbelievers. He said, why do you think lightly of the riches of his tolerance? of unbelievers and sinners, you know, people who don't know, of his, the riches of his patience. Don't you know? It's the kindness of God that leads people to repentance. See, the gospel message we must have is not a message that condemns people and beats them down, 
but as a message that tells about this God who is rich in kindness, rich in tolerance, rich in patience, rich in kindness, okay? Now, I don't know about Australia. I know about America and Europe and some other countries, but you don't hear that when you hear preaching. Preachers are kind of, we preach the law, you know, this is sin and you're a sinner and you need to, that's how they, that's how they preach to unbelievers. It doesn't work very well. You know, it turns a lot of people off. I'll just tell you a story from my country, you know, where uh, I got really upset at a bunch of the main preachers in my country. Um, it was 2004, and uh, we had a president from 2000 to 2004 called President Bush, and it was the election time, okay? And the Christians wanted to get Bush reelected, okay? So at... My church, actually, I went to in Colorado Springs. We have a lot of different international ministries. There was a meeting just a week before the election that was satellite broadcast to the whole country. And it was all the top Christian evangelical leaders. It was like James Dobson from Ministry Call, Focus on the Family, Tony Perkins, Family Research Council, all, all the main leaders. And uh, I had been in India. I got off a plane and I rushed right to the church. I only got in at the last 10 minutes. I want to see what was going on. And I got in just in time to see, I won't say the name, a big, very famous evangelical leader have a big wedding cake on the platform and a sledgehammer. And he smashed it with the sledgehammer and said, if we don't stop the gay agenda in America, this is what's going to happen to marriage. Then he went on about abortion, you know, and how this is it, it, talking, demonizing, and basically demonized people or spoke negatively about people involved in same-sex attraction stuff, women who've had abortions. And then they said, this is why we must vote for Bush, to turn this country around. Okay, I was sitting in the back with my understanding of who God is and what the gospel is. And this was broadcast to the whole country. And I was just bro brokenhearted. And the next morning, all these men were meeting. And I went to the meeting. I, didn't, I wasn't invited, but I just opened the I went by the secretary. She's saying, Fred, you can't go in there. And I was so mad, I opened the door. I burst into the meeting. And I just said, I am so mad at all of you. I said, here's why I'm mad. You put so much condemnation on people who don't know God that if any person caught up in same-sex attraction saw that and they wanted help, the last place they would come is to the church. Any woman who wanted forgiveness from God for abortion and to get you know, healing of the mind, the last place she would come to the church. I said, we are called to be a redemptive body. And you, you sold away our redemptive calling for political gain. That's what I told them. And I said, you sold out the gospel for political gain. We're redemptive. They said, they were all like, <laughs> they were kind of stunned. They said, well, what should we have said? I said, here's a, what do unbelievers, they think that we think we're better than them because of the way we preach and everything. You know what? I said, here's what we should say. We are just like you. We have all the same problems you have. We wrestle with all the same issues you wrestle with. The only difference is we're on a path. And we're walking on that path closer to God every day. Come on, join us on the path. Come join us on the path. We'll welcome you. Walk with us. We'll walk with you. Walk on the path. We don't care where you're coming from. Walk on the path. And you too will get closer to God every day. And day by day, he will heal us all. And they're like, oh, yeah, that, that would kind of work better, wouldn't it? <laughs> you know? I said, yeah, because that's actually the gospel. <laughs> You know, is a God who blesses us, who's not angry at us, who doesn't want to punish us, who wants to bring us freedom, right? So we, we though, in the preaching of the gospel, often are trying to bring conviction of sin because we focused on sin and saw in the death of Christ before we've even explained who God is to people who have no clue of who he is. So what happens is we often condemn when, and because we're trying to instigate guilt from the outside instead of letting the Holy Spirit convict from the inside as we talk about the glories of God, the delightfulness of God, the beauty of God, the love of God, the compassion of God, the mercy of God, see? And this is why most people reject uh, the gospel right now. 
Here's another thing we've got to do to bring healing to the gospel. Of all people, you guys, we should be realistic about human nature. What does the Bible teach about human nature? There's none righteous, no, not one. All are fallen, all are sinful, right? So we shouldn't demonize fallen human nature. We should expect that we're all fallen. And instead, here's what our message should be. We know these things about every pop, anywhere you go on the planet, these numbers are going to hold true. In a fallen world, people are warped, right? Uh, we're broken. And we know that in any population, about 16% of people have addictive personalities, right? So if we had the God's heart towards people and the message that God's a God of a blessing, we would treat, we would look at this different. 16% have addictive personalities. We know in any population around the world, about 7% are di get addicted to alcohol. We know it's more men than women, and that people are most susceptible up to age 29, okay? We know that about 2.3% get addicted to hard drugs. We know about 6% get addicted to gambling. This will be the same in India. It doesn't matter what country, you'll get roughly these numbers. We know things like 2 to 3%, we're going to have same-sex attraction. Instead of preaching so hardly against this, and you need a savior, which we do, a better way to approach this would be to say to kids at an appropriate age, 11, 12, I don't know, we don't demonize it. We say, guess what, you guys? Some changes are going to start happening in your life. You know, and about 16% of you might find that you're having some sort of addictive traits. You might start to like alcohol. You might start to like drugs, you know, or you might we like taking risks, you know, unreasonable risks or gambling. Two to three percent of you might start experiencing same-sex attraction. And instead of demonizing this so that people feel shame and then hide it and they don't get help for it until they stuff it down and hide it and suppress it for years and years and years until they get old enough, they're out from under the influence of the church and they just go off into worldly behaviors. Instead of that, we should say, this is just part of human fallenness. So guess what? Come and tell us. Come and tell us when this is happening. Because you know what? God is a God of blessing. You know, and we can help you work through your addictive personality, your same-sex, whatever it is. Instead of having this condemning law type preaching, we should preach positively, we're all fallen, God can fix it, come and talk to us. But instead, a lot of our young people, they're so shamed about human fallenness in them, they hide it until it's too late for them to get help sometimes because it's entrenched. Instead, we need to present the patience, tolerance, kindness of God. I know I've got to shut up in four minutes or so. Okay, is this boring? Is this good? Is this, this is some shifts we need to make. Okay, so listen, you guys. So look at this scripture. When I, when I look at this scripture uh, in Romans, think about, just think about. So how do we treat sinners? Think about how God treats you. This is what I say in churches. Think about how God treats you. I said, how many of you have secret sin <laughs> that you've never repented of? Is God smashing you? <laughs> is God making your life a mess? Or is he being patient with you? Is he being tolerant with you? Is he being kind with you? Is he still blessing you in spite of that? Is he still using you? <laughs> Think of how God treats you and they go, oh yeah, <laughs> you know. I said, shouldn't we treat unbelievers the same way? <laughs> with that patience, kindness, tenderness, tolerance, okay? And so we really need to bring healing to the gospel message we're sharing if, if we want to see uh, the gospel really go forth in, our, in the parts of the world where we are, like the Christianized countries and the rest of the world. So in order to bring healing to the gospel, many, some people are recognizing this. They're making some mistakes, okay? I love this quote by Samuel Johnson who's a very wise man from way back in history days. <laughs> he said, all the laws of heaven and earth are unable to prevent man from his crimes. He said, surely relaxing the laws of heaven and earth shall not dispose man to better behavior. What is the answer? Relaxing the law of God? No. Not relaxing the law of God. That's not the answer. 
to bring healing to the gospel. Instead, I think we need to find the balances of loving even unbelievers, loving without limit, you know, unconditionally. Uh, oops, embracing, embracing without embarrassing, you know, embracing, you know, without embarrassing. Okay, compassion for the human condition without compromising the law of God and acceptance of them, no matter what, who they are, what they're struggling with, acceptance, but with accountability to take steps forward, see? And that's, that's, that would represent a God who wants to bless, see, instead of a God who wants to condemn. So I think we need to uh, make some shifts like that. Now, there's another part of healing the gospel. <laughs> How did the Romans become Italians? <laughs> How did the Romans become Italians? <laughs> the Romans were cruel, <laughs> very cruel, brutal. <laughs> A big empire, you know. How did they become these happy Italians? Pizza, wine, let's dance, who love. <laughs> See, how did the Romans become Italians? Of course, they got Christianized. But how did they get Christianized? Was it harsh preaching and everything that converted Rome? It wasn't. You know what converted Rome? It wasn't preaching, actually. The intelligentsia of Rome converted first. You know what converted them? It was not preaching and all the preachers. It was individual Christians and how they were living. You know what they did, how the Christians won Rome? And ooh, you guys, if you want to read some awesome books, there's an author called, named Rodney Stark who wrote a whole bunch of books like How Christianity, uh, tri The Triumph of Christianity, or The Victory of Reason, or uh, Cities of God, where Rodney Stark is a historian at uh, Baylor University in the States. Uh, and his books, literally, uh, even non-believing historians can't pull them apart and show things wrong. He's respected even by non-believing historians. Cities of God, it's amazing. He shows where the top 31 cities in the Roman Empire were the cities that Christianized. And then the blessings of God came, and that rose them to the top in the Roman Empire. But how did the Romans become Italians? It wasn't preaching. Uh, it was individual Christians. What would happen in Rome? People would get sick, and they had diseases. You know, they didn't have doctors and medicine like we have. They would put the sick person outside the house, lay them in the street outside the door to die because they didn't want the whole family to get sick. And so there were people who were poor and didn't have enough food to eat, who were starving in Rome. A million people in Rome. Rome was amazing. They brought in 200 gallons of fresh water every day for every citizen. 200 million gallons a day into Rome of fresh water. So great technology and everything, but still weren't able to cure, take care of all the sick or feed all the poor, right? And so what did the Christians do? They walked the streets of Rome, and they picked up the people outside the doors, and they brought them to their own homes. And they nursed them back to health, or they helped them to die with dignity, not out in the street. That's what they did. What did they do? They walked the streets of Rome, knocking on doors. Do you have enough to eat? And the people who didn't have enough to eat, they said, come to our house, come eat at our house. And they didn't have much, but they shared their food with the others. In fact, you read in the writings of the early church, it says, Maria is going up to Rome for her glorification. This was a big mission that they did, see? What does that mean? Maria was like from Naples or something. She was called of God. She's going to Rome for her glorification. What does that mean? She was going to walk the streets picking up bodies, uh, people who were sick, bringing them into Christian homes and nursing them. She would get the disease herself, her glorification. She would go and be with God in heaven. See? And it wasn't through preaching that they won Rome. It was through acts of mercy and expressions of a God who's a God of blessing, who cares about our health, cares about our well-being, cares about our education. That's how the Romans became Italians. It wasn't wise preaching. It was this expression of the grace, mercy, blessing of God to the people in the deepest need. That's how the Romans became Italians. 
And that's how we're going to reach our societies in the developed world today that are turning against Christ. And the rest of the world, we're going to show them through our actions that our God is a God of blessing. Now I have to really shut up. Uh. So you guys, we need to bring healing to the gospel. It needs to become a message of our God is a wonderful God. He's a God. And we need to specialize that in being able to talk about the love of God, the, the compassion of God, the delightfulness of God, the beauty of God, his tender mercy. You know, we need to be able to express that. And I have found most Christians cannot. They cannot carry on a discussion with unbelievers about the beauty of God. See, this is part of we've lost the theology of beauty. You know what I do? I love doing this. I go to secular universities. I spoke at Yale recently. They invited me up to speak. You know what I say to the students? I say, hey, I'd like to have a discussion of what of sex outside of marriage and why I think this isn't a good thing. Any of you who want to talk about sex outside of marriage and why this isn't a good thing, let's come, let's meet in the quad, talk. I will not use the Bible. I will not quote the scripture. Let's talk about it. And we have an open discussion with secular university students about why sex outside of marriage causes destruction. And in every situation, about 40% say, Oh my gosh, I've never thought about that. I've really got to rethink my life. Another 40% say, whoa, I've got to change my, they're not, they don't, I'm not, they're not getting saved. They're saying, wow, I've got to change how I'm living with my sexual expression. And about 20% just go, ah, I'm, I, you're crazy, see? And you know what? That's what we've lost the ability to do, is to portray the beauty of holiness in a way that people can understand that's a way that's the blessing of God, you know, to not have sex outside of marriage. How is this a blessing? We've lost the ability to portray a good God. And why, why would God say this? Is he trying to restrict your fun? No. He's trying to bless you because he's a God of blessing, see? And this is why we're losing our societies and not having as much impact as the world as we can. So we've got to bring healing to the gospel message we preach and get back to the roots. God is a God of blessing, and because he's a God of blessing, he sent Jesus to help us. That's part of it, too. Now, it's getting, it's too late. I can't tell you there's more to healing the gospel. That's one half of healing the gospel, the changes we need to make, but probably really some of the most important for you guys. So I really hope that you can become people. Ooh, one last tip. Sorry, then I've got to shut up. <laughs> you know, I really think beauty, beauty is absolutely, the world's getting worse. You guys notice the world's getting worse, getting dark, getting messed up? It's beauty that's going to be a testimony of who God is, the goodness of God, blessing of God. There's an awesome book. It's very hard to read, but... If you have grit and determination, I would like to encourage you to read it. It's called The Evidential Power of Beauty. The Evidential Power of Beauty by a Catholic priest named Dubay, D-U-B-A-Y. Okay, we don't have a well-reasoned theology of beauty in the Catholic Church, so we don't know how to present God as the God of blessing. We don't know how to present God as the God of beauty. And, and so... This book, the, I don't agree with everything in it because it's a Catholic book and there are some things I just don't agree with. But if you can spit out the bones and eat the meat, it is a powerful book that will empower us and help us to present a God who's a God of love, a God who is rich in kindness, rich in patience, rich in tolerance, you know, rich in loving kindness, and that's what leads people to repentance. He's a God who wants to bless and not curse, who's not against us, who's for us, instead of the moralistic preaching that we do that turns people off. The Evidential Power of Beauty by Dubay. Thirteenth chapter on the beauty of holiness is just spectacular. It's what we lack, actually, uh, an idea we lack in the Protestant church. That's why we can't call people to holiness very much, is we don't know how to present it from a good, blessing, compassionate, loving God, okay? So what I love about our mission is God kind of has us running ahead in many ways. We kind of lead, lead the body of Christ in many ways. Now, we're really 
we have more of the balance of this stuff in YWAM than most of the church has. And I believe God wants to use us not only to reach the world, but to have an impact on the church to help them understand the true gospel message and kind of bring healing to the gospel so that the world can come to know Christ. And especially you guys with a ship ministry and the kind of ministry you do, that's the gospel. You all know what St. Francis said, preach the gospel at all times, sometimes use words. And that's what we really need to be able to do. Heal the gospel and show a loving, tender, kind, gracious God. Okay, I'm shutting up now. Bless you, Robin. Thank you.